there was a, a big real estate crisis in Southeast, and black people were moving, were made to move out of Southeast into other areas. So my family decided to move to Adams Morgan in July of 1964. On our block alone, Ontario Place, there was about 58 or to 60 children, kids, teenagers or so. And it was like you could not see clear from one end to the other because children was all over the place. And they had no place to play and no place to go. So they took to the street. It was not too many things that Walter was not involved in. He had his nose and his heart in a lot of activities that went on in the entire Adams Morgan. The Ontario Laker program, okay, came about because of the fact that we didn't have no place to go. And there was not no organized sports program for youth there. So therefore, he felt, well, he would come up with the idea of the Ontario Lakers. Now, the name came from the L.A. Lakers, okay? So they were champions at the time. And he said, well, if they're the champions and we're going to have a program, we might as well name our group the Ontario Lakers. And it was the Ontario Lakers came out of that from the L.A. Lakers, okay? And the rest was history. In the beginning, there was a whole lot of people in the community that thought Walter and I, that we were crazy. Y'all, how in the world y'all think y'all gonna take this man's property and turn it into a park? That ain't gonna never happen, you know what I mean? But dreams come true. In order for Walter and Ronald to accomplish their goal of building a, a park or a playground for the community, what they had to do basically was to show land use. Over there on the land itself, they would have, uh, Walter always wanted playground equipment. So they had to make their own playground equipment. They would get swings that were dilapidated, put them together. They'd make themselves like a little merry-go-round. And uh, they cleared the land for baseball, organized sports. Organized sports, they had football, baseball, basketball, soccer. I think uh, in the memory of a lot of people, uh, the impact was that they had something to do, something constructive to do with their lives, and um, Walter was always about doing something constructive. You had to be hands-on, you had to be willing to work, and to make great sacrifice, and that's what the kids did, and all of the young kids did, and Walter, you know, he was right along there with them. The Institute for Policy Studies, which was a think tank, which still exists, had taken a peek at me, come by and talk to us, we'll support you because you are beginning to think about how to practice architecture in a disruptive way. So I got myself a little storefront on Florida Avenue for 85 bucks a month. I now set up my little shop. I'm wearing coveralls and hair and beard, blah, 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 talking black power, right? And kids are peeking in, man. They're like, who's this dude, man? What's this all about, right? So I figured out a way to flip the space so I could teach art to the kids. So that kind of energy caused me, along with work ethic, to see new and interesting ways to build this thing called the new thing, which ended up being an old church, an old laundromat, an old ballroom, an old furniture store, two old brownstones, photography, um, graphics, um, African dance, African percussion, uh, grew up, grew into a, a jazz concert every week, a blues festival at Howard. It really started out as me just trying to figure out how to be this, how to encourage the democratization of architecture and planning into this thing where I've 
got attached to all these kids and was trying to build and create these experiences and platforms mm -hmm. for them uh, where, in fact, art could help them begin to connect to a conscious experience that was Afrocentric so that they could feel stronger, smarter, competent, mm -hmm. celebrated, uh, feel like they had some kind of historical lineage and they just didn't get off the boat with slavery. And so uh, I was very consciously and conscientiously uh, working to make, create consciousness, but it do it in a very artful way, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we never, we never lowered the bar on the art mm -hmm. because we were winning gold medals in design, winning film festivals. It just, mm -hmm. it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was an energy that created mm. itself that I did not anticipate. I was working at the Institute for Policy Studies, and I got to know people who, one person in particular, Milton Kotler, who had written a book about neighborhood government, and I got to know Milton. Um, I got to know a man named Topper Carew, who ran a community organization in Adams Morgan called the New Thing Art and Architecture Center. Unlike other neighborhoods where the city came in and actually, or not the city, but certainly even the federal government came in and intervened with direction and policy um, that would supposedly lead to improved quality of life and, you know, better for all, um, like Southwest, even like Shaw where there was a significant effort to build affordable housing. Uh, the churches were very involved there. Um, nobody wanted to deal with Adams Morgan because it was diverse. It was like, oh, if you talk to the white people, the black folks are going to, well, if you talk to the Latinos, you know. And so nobody wanted to deal with Adams Morgan and consequently trying to get anything done or changed or improved in Adams Morgan was like knocking your head on the wall. I can remember when we started having community meetings and we had these meetings every Saturday morning at the Potter's House where we would bring, try to get more and more people to come to the meetings and the food and the coffee was really important. Um, to get people there on Saturday mornings. And that was kind of the core of the organizing that we, we began to do um, to talk about what people wanted to have in the neighborhood and what the community wanted to have and what the issues were and uh, how do you resolve that. There were many class and racial divisions in, in Adams Morgan. But there were always, and I think that was the importance of the work we were doing, there were always issues that brought people together. Um, and the structure that was created in the Adams Morgan organization allowed for that kind of um, structure because there were elected representatives from single member districts and there were quarterly town meetings, but there were these project committees and the project committees would work on stuff and bring it to the, to the town meetings, bring it to their elected reps. But it was all very, very hands-on um, and very real. I mean, there were people in the neighborhood who were very clear that, you know, the people in Adams Morgan could govern themselves. We didn't, you know, we needed some tax dollars. That would have been nice, but we could make decisions for ourselves. The result in the District of Columbia is that we passed rent control, that the first rent control law was put in place. And it wasn't so much the rent control per se as it was um, eviction controls. So that became kind of the nucleus of the most progressive legislation that ever existed in the country around the issue of evictions and um, housing costs. The biggest displacement issue in Adams Morgan was Seton Street. And that is really significant because it's the first time that we were dealing with, and I'll never forget, Lavinia Harvey, who was one of Miss Fanny's best friends, came into the office and said, Marie, 
I think you better come down to Seton Street. And I said, well, why? You know, what's going on? And she said, everybody on the block got eviction notices. And a developer had purchased the properties and handed out 26 eviction notices in one block. And that was when you really saw what displacement looked like. It led to the second rent control law, which extended the right to purchase to multifamily buildings. Oh my God. Then we had a whole nother thing that was very much citywide on our hands. Um, and that was um, how do you work to organize tenants to buy their building? Marion Barry had been elected mayor. Um, I guess politically, I made a huge decision and went to work uh, at the DC Department of Housing where we created something called the Tenant Purchase Program. During his first term, we converted three th over 3,000 units of rental housing to tenant ownership. You know, it was just, it was just amazing.